Hi, hello, and other such phrases. I am the Defective Brain. I'm going to tell you about the total synthesis of a functional designer eukaryotic chromosome, published in Science on the 4th of April. There have been headlines declaring that we're now one step closer to redesigning life, that the first ever artificial chromosome has been made. I'm here to cut through all of that to give you the, my reading of the paper at the centre of this hype. It all circles around the Synthetic Yeast Project, where scientists around the world are working towards producing the first yeast with a fully engineered genome, designed and built in a laboratory. Researchers in this group have been working to redesign the yeast genome one bit at a time for a while. In previous work, they managed to design and engineer one arm of the yeast chromosome. Here, they attempted to make a synthetic version of an entire yeast chromosome. But just one. They started with the smallest yeast chromosome, which is chromosome 3, the sex chromosome. The yeast have a gene on this chromosome called MAT, which can either be type A or type alpha. Type A cells can only mate with alpha, and alpha cells can only mate with type A. When they do mate, the cells fuse to form a diploid cell with both copies of chromosome 3. This cell has both copies of the MAT genes, which cancel out each other's effect, preventing this new cell from mating. So the researchers set themselves a the task of making a synthetic version of this chromosome. This chromosome needed to be just as good as a normal chromosome 3 and do everything that it does. They looked at the genetic structure of chromosome 3, and then they redesigned it. The first step was to remove any excess code. Anything that was taking up a lot of space but not really doing anything. More, most importantly, they had to ensure that the whole DNA strand was stable. There are selfish genetic elements which can invade the chromosomes at certain points, and splice themselves into the code. The worst offenders are retrotransposons, which jump all over the genome. For a precisely engineered chromosome, they can throw a real spanner in the works. So any targets of retrotransposons were thrown out. These included genes encoding tRNA, and tRNA performs a key role in translating the genetic code into protein structures. Unfortunately, retrotransposons use tRNA genes as targets, so they had to be removed from the chromosome. Even though chromosome 3 is the smallest of the yeast chromosomes, this is still a huge project. Immense amounts of DNA need to be made, there is no room for error. No mistakes could be allowed to enter the design, and the engineering and the production of this chromosome was going to turn out to be very expensive. So they did what any good engineer would do. They broke the job up into smaller parts, and they handed over production to cheap, unskilled workers. The researchers took the schematic for the genome, and chopped up into much smaller parts called oligonucleotides. Each of these covered a 70-nucleotide stretch of the genome, and were designed with complementary ends that could slot into each other, and make up longer stretches of the genome, about 750 base pairs long, which were known as building blocks. But who would be clicking these building blocks together? That is where the cheap labour comes in. The undergrad students. The researchers ran a course called Build a Genome, in which students could get a taste of what it's like to be a real scientist. Teams of students were tasked with making a 750 base pair building block of the yeast genome, which were then sequenced to check errors. And this was how 367 building blocks were created. It was then time for the researchers to take over. They had two ways of doing this. The first way was Gibson assembly. This is a newfangled way of assembling genes together, made famous by its use in creating one of the first synthetic life forms, Mycobacterium laboratorium. The essential idea is that you have two blocks of DNA you want to stitch together, each with matching sites on each end. A DNA chewing enzyme nibbles away at the ends of one of those strands, and the exposed strand fits together perfectly with the exposed end of the other strand, allowing it to form just one long strand. The next technique they use is something called user. In this case, when the DNA strands are created, a uracil is introduced into the sequence near the edges of the strand. An enzyme called user spots the uracil and breaks it out of the DNA strand. Another enzyme spots a missing base and breaks a backbone at this point, removing the short chunk of DNA from the strand, leaving two strands with compatible ends, which click together, forming a much longer strand. The researchers use these techniques to build mini chunks, and here is where the building gets clever. You see, all those previous methods require complementary ends of DNA to be stitched together. We have a similar process in biological organisms, which is known as homologous recombination, and yeast is very good at doing that. In the past, yeast has been used to knit together fragments of bacterial DNA into a whole genome. All that's required is a good amount of overlapping sequence. Each of these mini chunks were engineered with that in mind. They were designed with 40 base pair regions on each end. They were inserted into a yeast, which would then assemble each individual segment of the DNA into one much larger piece of DNA. But here is where it gets clever. Those long strands of DNA will have lots of similarity to the host genome, so the same apparatus that knits them together can also cause these chunks to re replace regions of chromosome 3. The researchers introduced genes at the end of these chunks that could be used to identify which yeasts had successfully integrated these synthetic chunks of DNA into the chromosome. These markers would generally be nutrient deficiency genes. But wait, you may ask, surely this is breaking the prime part of their design ethic, that this chromosome must be as good as the original chromosome. And that's where it gets clever because the next chunk of DNA erases the end genes, conferring the fitness problems, replacing them with a different nutrient marker. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you make a synthetic version of a yeast chromosome. But there was a basic problem with the design. You may have already spotted it. Remember how I told you that they got rid of all the tRNA genes because retrotransposons love to use them for target practice? Turns out, cells need tRNAs to live. There was one tRNA gene in particular called SUP61, which was only found on chromosome 3. 
Deleting that gene would prevent lots of proteins from being made, so they had to put it back in somehow. They ended up redesigning the gene to try and make it less vulnerable to retrotranspose on attack, and then they put it back on the yeast on a section of chromosome 4. So now that that problem was sorted out, they needed to check that all their chromosome 3 was made from their synthetic sequence, that their design was definitely there. So in the process of designing the chromosome, they changed the structure of the stop codons at the ends of the genes ever so slightly so as not to change their function, but so that they could be detected using specially designed oligonucleotides. These nucleotides could be used to replicate DNA that matched those tags, but they wouldn't work if they weren't present. They tested all of the genes, and pretty much all of them had synthetic tags, except for YCP4. This synthetic chromosome wasn't completely synthetic yet. They had to replace that gene with a synthetic version, much in the same way as they did with all the others, through using homologous recombination. Now they sorted that little problem out, they can definitely say that they have a functioning synthetic chromosome but they needed to confirm that their design behaved like the original. They tested the original yeast against yeast that had half a synthetic chromosome, and yeast with a full synthetic chromosome under different growth conditions. For most of these experiments, instead of giving us cell counts, we get photos of bacteria on plates. And if you paid attention to my last video, you can pretty much already predict my problem with these experiments. They looked at the morphology of the yeast cells through the microscope during the conversion of chromosome 3 to its synthetic counterpart. And at the point where the chromosome had become 80% synthetic, the shapes of the yeast began to change. Some of them elongated. Were these genes being expressed in the same way on the synthetic chromosome as they were on the original chromosome? So they looked at the messenger RNAs, compared between the synthetic and the original chromosome. They noticed that certain genes did in fact change significantly, and the degree of change is shown on the x-axis of this volcano plot. The negative numbers show genes that are expressed at lower levels with the synthetic chromosome, the positive numbers show genes that are expressed more with the synthetic chromosome. The question is, are these differences significant? That is where the y-axis comes in. This shows the probability that these changes are due, are due to chance, with a dotted line showing the threshold of significance. It turns out that a couple of genes stopped being expressed, mostly because these were deleted from the chromosome during the initial design stages of the synthetic gene. So there are differences. But do they mean that this chromosome is unstable? Will it fall apart at the slightest notice? To work out whether this happened, the researchers grew their yeast over 100 generations, at each one testing to make sure that their synthetic tags were all intact, and found that actually this synthetic chromosome is pretty stable. In their design, they included locks P sites between every gene in the chromosome. This is so that they could scramble them up at short notice using a special enzyme called Cre. The type of Cre enzyme they used would splice together genes in between locks P sites at random, but only when there's estradiol present. So they could put the gene for the Cre enzyme into a cell, and Cre would be expressed, but it would only be activated when estradiol was present. So they could effectively scramble the entire synthetic genome. As you can imagine, this scrambling process causes a lot of genes to be inactivated, a lot of genes to be lost, which in many cases can cause these yeast cells to die off. The researchers then mated this synthetic yeast with the wild type yeast to produce diploid cells with both mat A and mat alpha genes with the synthetic chromosome carrying the mat alpha. But if we introduce Cre into this situation, the synthetic chromosome gets scrambled up and mat alpha is likely to become completely inactivated. The removal of mat alpha means that mat A becomes dominant, which can now mate with other alpha cells, even though it's diploid. This is all a massive achievement. The biggest innovation here is not so much to do with scientific technology, but to do with the actual work ethic. The organisation needed to pull off this feat, the way they managed to involve the undergraduate students directly in the scientific process. And that truly is a leap forward for both science and science education. But, as always, I have to lodge some criticisms of this work, because even the best papers have problems. Let's see what the limits of this study were. I'll give them credit for trying to change structure of SUP61, to try and make it more resistant to transposon attack. But did it work? We don't know, because they didn't actually test it. They hid the gene away on chromosome 4, and it's never seen or heard from again. Showing pictures of serial dilutions is the most shitty way of covering the fact that your experiments have an N of 1, you're turning quantitative data into qualitative data, which apparently means you have permission not to indulge in any statistical analysis. We have to rely on the rather shitty human pattern recognition system, which can only be relied on to spot the largest of differences and to ignore the most subtle differences. The cynic in me would suggest that's the point, to hide all the small differences between this yeast synthetic chromosome and the host. But that brings me to my main issue with this paper. I'll be honest, it's a disagreement that's up for debate depending on whether you read this like an engineer, or a scientist, I'm taking the position that the purpose of this paper was to design a fully functional version of the yeast chromosome 3. The point of concern for me is the statistical analysis they used for the messenger RNA data. They wanted to validate their chromosome to ensure that there wasn't any functional change caused by their edits to it. They analysed their data using a statistical method designed to analyse the differential expression of sequences, which actually, when you really think about it, makes things a bit hairy when you're trying to use this method to validate the similarity between genes. Because you can very easily fall into the proving the null hypothesis fallacy. When you use a st statistical test like that, that's geared to detecting a specific difference, you can leap to the conclusion that not finding a difference 
is the same as finding a similarity. And that isn't exactly right. Because failing to disprove the assumption that you brought with you to the experiment doesn't actually prove that assumption. It just means that your test failed to disprove it, which is a core tenet of hypothesis-driven research. You don't know whether that assumption is actually true at the beginning of the experiment, and you still don't know whether it's true at the end of it. The point is that the researchers haven't really shown that their chromosome fulfills the role of the chromosome they're replacing. They haven't validated it properly. To do that, they would have to use a different null hypothesis that the synthetic yeast chromosome is going to be different from the original, and disprove that to actually validate them as similar. But, if you want to take the position that the point of this study was to prove that the synthetic chromosome behaves differently from the normal chromosome, then the study did all the right statistical tests. That is my conundrum. If you take the perspective of a scientist interested in finding definitive flaws of the machine, these tests are okay. But if we do take that second viewpoint, then based on the evidence we have presented, we cannot say for certain that this new synthetic chromosome works just like the original, and we do not have confirmation that the design principles used to generate this chromosome will actually work out when they try to apply them to a whole organism. Even if this chromosome is different and not entirely functional, that in itself can be interesting. It suggests that there was some issue with the design principles that we don't know about, and probably would never have known about were it not for this paper. And that's an exciting prospect for a scientist, because we can now test and analyze the expression of genes not just based on their code, but their context within the whole genome. But if you look at this from the perspective of someone who just wants to create a fully functional synthetic life right now, then it doesn't quite live up to that ex expectation. But obviously that last point is up for debate. Can we look at this study like an engineer trying to ensure that all the parts of his synthetic genome will work? Or should we look at it like a scientist, interested in understanding the cell in a much deeper way than before? Frankly, both ways are valid, but it's something that you need to consider when thinking about the greater implications of this study. Mm -hmm.